Hello, everybody. Welcome to another training report here on the Blue Abroad YouTube channel. I was there today. I was graced with the presence of Ian, one half of the Navy Blue Corner. So I thought we should absolutely be doing a joint report. Hello, mate. Hey, Terry, mate. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. For sure, mate. For sure. It was, uh, it was a good day to be out. The sun was out. Uh, we eventually got into the shade, but still a good day. <laughs> Yeah, oh, mate, a couple of dramas sorting that out. Luckily, you and Paolo, men of the people, made sure that you opened Icon Park to the rest of us and we were able to get into some shade eventually. Yeah, I didn't want to have a repeat of last year. I remember I went to, I think it was a scratch match and one half of my face was completely burnt <laughs> and the other half was not. So I wasn't having any of that again. <laughs> definitely not, definitely not. Yeah, Um I don't know. I'll let you kick off. What were your takeaways from training today? It's an interesting one. Yeah. I don't I want to come on with as much positivity as possible, but it's always that thing where it is a it is training, it is preseason training. So there's not heaps you can probably always take out of it. I probably went in thinking I really just wanted to see a lot of the the newer players, whether that's a Blake Akers or a lot of the young draftees, because probably, you know. 12 months ago, a lot of it was around, oh, what are we going to do with Vossi? How are, what positions are certain guys going to be playing in? What will it look like? But we kind of know what the superstars are going to do. You know, Harry's going to be good. Charlie's going to be good. The midfield should run. It's now these little pieces that I was probably looking for. And honestly, the big standout of the, the whole training, if there probably was one for me, was Ollie Hollands. I was incredibly impressed. I was pretty hyped beforehand, but it was... Will this guy that is incredibly skinny, light frame, how's he going to go with, you know, seasoned AFL players? And it just seemed whenever they were doing a bit of match sim or, or any of the drills, he was always near the ball, always clean, seemed to make some decent decisions. And yeah, I mean, if I don't want to go too big, but if there was a match tomorrow and his name was, was on the team sheet, you definitely wouldn't be worried about what he could potentially produce. I was incredibly impressed with uh, young Ollie Hollands. Yeah, I've been... <sighs> really hesitant to talk about any yeah. of the first year players as guys that will play around one mm. or anything like that. Like, I don't want to put any pressure on them, but yeah. you're right. I, I felt like in all of the match sim, he just had this knack of being mm. where the ball is or where the ball was going to be always one yeah. kick away. Um, a few nice passages of play where, you know, he just ducks and dives mm. and weaves through traffic um, there was one great passage of play where I think he tried to sidestep Adam Saad and I think he got taught a little bit of a lesson and yeah. Saad he pinned him. Um, but that's mm. all right. That's that's yeah. that's what it's for. You you want him to play with confidence. And um, I think when you're, when you're using sidesteps, there's mm. certain players you're not going to be able to do it against. And an All-Australian defender in Saad is certainly not one of them. Mm. Yeah, and I was pretty impressed as well, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, that it, it looked like him and Vossi were having quite a few chats in between the match sim when... The, the sort of play stopped. He immediately would go to Voss and ask him questions. And there was a, quite a lot of feedback, I guess, back and forth on that. So that's always something you're probably keen to see at training. What, what's actually going on? Are they getting direction if something's either going right or wrong? And he was probably one of the main ones that I noticed continually go to Voss to try to, I guess, maybe understand things a little bit more. So I think that's at least a, a good thing that he's probably wanting to learn and understand what his role exactly is and how he can probably better execute. Mm. I think, well, there's two other pieces of news which I think were most relevant for us today. Um, we'll start with the good news because Dave Cunningham participated in the match sim, which I'm not sure mm. if that was the first time he had done that or if it was one of the first few times he's done that since since being injured. But, I mean, not to talk mm. up too much about what he did, but just to see him back out there with yeah. footy in hand, tackling and getting tackled and, you know, in the thick of it. It's a good step for him. Mm. Yeah, like uh, when I was writing any notes for this, one of mine literally just was great to see him on the park. Like did not necessarily do anything overly impressive, but him just being out there is almost just as impressive and he's obviously going to be a bit rusty. But I think if anyone's listened to the, the Summer Sessions podcast with Luke Power, Luke Power himself was talking up Cunningham, just saying that he, he's this classy mover. He's sort of skillful when he has the ball and can – maybe at a different dynamic at times. And there are a few stages where he gets the ball and does some okay things, but I think that's just mainly it. We just want to see him out there and, and being fit enough. 
it was good to see as well. I think with a few of the players that there was clearly a modified program for them. If they if they're not a hundred percent, then don't do every single second of training and just try and get the best out of them. And you know, I'm hoping that this can be the start of Dunning, David Cunningham finally getting some sort of football back into him. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there, there were, I mean, there were a few on the modified program, no mm. different to what we've he- heard over the last yeah. few weeks. Jack Martin, Sam Walsh, Caleb Marchbank. I think Fogarty is another one in that bracket. Yeah. Um Obviously, we've we've lost Zach Williams. He wasn't there. McGovern, mm. I didn't see him at all today. I actually didn't see yeah. him physically out there at all. So I'm not sure what that's about. I know he didn't train at the last open session. And mm. I remember being told that, you know, he had just done a big session a few days earlier. And, and even so today, they, they've just come back from their camp. They've had four yeah. days off because the camp was apparently grueling. And I don't know, to be honest, it probably showed a little bit. Some of the skill errors were, were there. Yeah. I, I felt like it wasn't as sharp of a session as mm. what the last open session was. I thought the last time I went there, it was, it was super intense, uh, pretty, pretty high skill level as well. Um, but you know, there's always little flashes there. I think like when I watch the standouts, I- I'm always mindful. I think I go into the session looking for certain players. Like today it was mm. really, I was looking for Oleg Markov, which I guess that's a great segue because that's the other bit of news. Um, yeah. We get to training. I really went there with, Oleg Markov front of mind mm. thinking, all right, let's just see what he's about. We know he's going to be training with us to see if he's going to get that last spot. And then 30 minutes into being in training, we get the the tweet that he's um, he's turned his back mm. on the Calgary club to go play for Collingwood. So, hey, fair play to him. It is what it is. Yeah, it was a bit of interesting news. Definitely as you start these open trainings, you immediately are just trying to find who's there and who's not there. It was one that we're all, where is Markov? Like, I can't see him. Maybe he's there. And then, yeah, the news filters in that Collingwood have snagged him back, even though we were just trying to steal him from them. It's it's probably a bit frustrating in a way that, obviously, with the Zach Williams injury, he was probably the only one out there with any kind of AFL experience to potentially bring onto your list. And I don't think anyone was really expecting Oleg to come in and be this superstar and play straight away. It was more... If everything goes wrong and he has to play, at least you kind of know what you're getting with a player like that. You, you can play at the level to a, to an extent. And he fits that mold of that running half back. Him turning his back, it, I guess it opens a door for a, a Ching Cotter potentially to take that list spot. But I think I was probably maybe looking forward to more of a, a Markov in that essence that we kind of knew what he could be. But maybe, maybe it could be a blessing in disguise. Maybe Ching Cotter could be what we're after, I guess we just kind of have to roll with the punches on that one. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I haven't seen Chinkot. We were talking about it today. The thing mm. about Chinkot, I haven't seen him play at the AFL yeah. level. I've seen him play at the VFL level and he's he's quite handy and he's mm. a solid player. I think the idea of Markov made a lot of sense. He, he seemed to be the best of the rest available to yeah. fill the Zach Williams role, you know, a real offensive threat from, from defense. So, that was where I was pretty excited to have a guy like Markov because he's been in the system for a mm. while. He's 26, I think. So, you know, he's been through, through a few clubs, played at Richmond, and he was on the list at Richmond when they were going through yeah. the, the beginning of that uh, dynasty, we might call it, or mini dynasty, if you want to mm. label it. I'm not sure how you, how you see it. But, yeah, I mean, like we say it all the time, it is what it is. got to move mm. on. And now it's on to the next and the next available. Um, I mean, there's... There's plenty out there on the park. We've got a lot of talent. We've got a lot of yes. talent that's entering a, a phase in their career where they're becoming senior. Mm. And it's it's the it's the tough part of this this caper that when you just don't know what you're going to get with these kind of guys. And I'm also trying to maybe look from within. What what can we get? And that probably immediately the rest of the session I was trying to look at like you know a lucky cow and what's he like at, at the level? And you know he's still very raw. Only just turned you know 18. Uh, the other the other week, I think it was, but you just saw glimpses at, at times with his disposal, particularly he's got this, you know, 60 metre kick to transition and just go the opposite way. And he seemed to nail most of those, particularly under pressure, which is probably what I was looking for. And whether he's ready or not, it's it's another player that's in that mould that we have on the list. And Chincotta was then another that we were looking at that didn't necessarily stand out. And yeah, is there, do you think there's any other players maybe in a different position that, I guess, skill set-wise, you could maybe float into that? Or are you still happy with 
the rest of the players that we maybe have out there. You mean from our list? Yeah. Those who are, that could fill a, a roll mm. down back? I mean, I don't know. I think I'm looking at... I think that the one guy that's been overlooked in this whole situation, and it happens all the time, it's Lockie Plowman. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's Lockie Plowman. Now, he's not the dasher uh, mm. that, that Zach Williams is, obviously. Um, but the guy's a, you know, a, a defensive-minded guy yeah. back there. Uh, Zach's obviously more of an offensive-minded guy who can help re- really generate ball forward and, and, and get the mm. meters gained. Plow obviously cops a, a bad rap from from supporters and I think footy world in general, but he's a senior guy and also he's durable and he's available. Mm-hmm. And we know firsthand most of the battle, it seems lately, is about you know who's available, who can stay on the park. So uh, for all the knockers out there, I think I think Lockie Plowman can come in and fill a role. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's going to change the planning because it looked yeah. like before Zach got injured that we were going to use really look to get him the ball and start mm. our transition, you know, via him. So we'll see. But I mean, whether Saad plays a different role than what was planned, there's that. Mm. Um, Doherty can always rotate there as well. Uh, I know that there are plans to put him through the midfield. I don't know if we're really going to have a a six-man midfield who only play midfield. I would yeah. assume that there's going to be a bit of rotation going on there. So um, Doc's obviously well-equipped to play that role back there. And then there's the next layer of, all right, well, Brody Kemp, hello. Like, yeah. there's an opportunity. It's here. Like, you know, there's an opportunity to, to play and find a spot. Cowan, very young, but still mm. opportunity. Um, yeah. And I mean, you know, then there's a mm. step up of Nick Newman and these types. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting that you bring up Plowman because I thought actually today at training he was one of the better players. I didn't really see him get beaten too much, like defensively, and I know he has a lot of people bashing him for for most of the time, but he was pretty, really good defensively, and I wonder if that is an element that at times we maybe use him as that more defensive grunt work to maybe unlock something else. Does, Does he come in to cover you know, McGovern a little bit more so we can use his rebound at stages. There's there's still facets that we can clearly go down. And I think that was probably the fun part of the training today is just trying to get little glimpses of different players. Um, But I probably wanted to go back a little bit to maybe like the the skills. That was probably my negative in the training. There was a lot of probably turnovers by foot. And it probably left me when I left training going, are we 100% ready? It was a little bit like slightly concerning, but on the flip side, uh, probably trying to reflect on it, you wonder how much – is it just like a directive thing where they're, they're trying to work on something? Because from the, the way the training was set up, it sort of started with these transitioning work drills from the back half, went into match sim, and then a bit more sort of stoppage craft. And I wonder if um, they were actually looking at a different way to move the ball. And it looked like there were a lot of sort of short kicks that maybe weren't going the distance. And there was even a, a moment where I think it was Sam Durden had the ball and – had it on that half back line, and all of a sudden you just hear Vossi yell at him like, took too long, what are you doing? And I think we just love those little insights, but clearly there's a directive on how we want to move the ball, and maybe there was an element of, okay, you're going to make some mistakes while you're trying something new, but it's about attempting it, and then eventually once this becomes something that they're completely used to and they know what they're doing, then the execution probably goes on to it, but I thought that was an interesting element of that, you know, transition's a big part of this offseason, and I guess, trying to see it in action today. Mm. I mean, we've got the runners now. There's no doubt about that. There's mm. no shortage of guys who can run at a really high level, especially along those wings in, you know, those young yeah. boys and Blake Akers. Yeah, I, I, I took I took a real interest to that. Vossi screaming out that, that yeah. Sam Bird had taken a little too long. Um, I guess, and then even reading Aaron Hamill's comments uh, about mm. the session and about training and, just reinforcing the whole, you know, we need to figure out when to go yeah. and when when to hold up play because I think when it comes down to us moving the ball quickly and being exciting mm-hmm. and energetic, I think we're pretty solid at that type of game. When it comes to slowing the play down and, you know, eating up the clock mm-hmm. when we need to, um, especially under pressure, that's just yeah. something we've yet to, to nail just yet. So um, it's tough because you can practice it all you want at training, but there's yeah. no intensity like a game. There's just not. Mm. And then when you talk about the additional external factors of what happened at the end of last year and finals on the line, um, I guess we just got to put ourselves in a position this year where we're not waiting until the last two, three weeks of the season to get that final spot. 
yeah, I, I definitely agree. And it's just that next layer that he's going to propel us forward because there was a times at training where some of the ball movement, the quick handballs, the quick kicks, there was, as you mentioned, so many runners moving that ball forward and all you need is to kick it into that forward line. And Charlie and Harry are going to take those clunks. You saw that. And at times, you know, a little Harry Lemmy looked okay, moved okay for, for his age, and he's definitely got the height down there. So that, that's the exciting part. And it's clearly just about when we need to do it. And at times, you know, yeah, it might be the, a potential time to – sprint through the middle of the park, but are we 100% set up defensively if we do turn the ball over and just trying to get those little components right? But I think there's still plenty to be excited about. Like if you looked at Charlie, they were doing some just running back and forth. I know you were very hot on this, but he was leading the sprinting groups every single time. And there was guys like Ollie Hollands that are you know, known for their you know endurance. And every single time Charlie Kerno was at the front of this group, and there were midfielders, you know, George Hewitt, all these kind of guys. And it's just insane that this massive Coleman medalist forward can run as well. It was just insane to watch him go go about it. It was. I remember seeing the first, I think they were doing 200s. And mm. I remember seeing the first one thinking, all right, he's at the yeah. front. But all right, let's, let's see them do three or four or five of them and see if he's still at the front. He was at the front of this pack four to five <laughs> times. However many times they ended up doing those mm. runs. You just sit there and you realize, yeah. like, shit, like that's that's our that's our full forward or that's our mm. forward. That's our one of our Coleman medalists. Um, yeah, there's something there's something about Charlie this this preseason. He mm. he always stands out. He's got that athleticism. He's got that that way he moves. But I think you know, touch wood. I don't want to jinx mm. anything, but you know, this will be yeah. his second full preseason since returning properly. Mm. So I mean, he's just turned 25. Yeah you can be quick to forget that he's still quite at a point where he's still improving. You know, he's still yeah. got development to come. And I think the more uninterrupted uh, experience that he gets, the quicker he's going to be at his best. I mean, I, I already, I already think he played the best season of his career and the way I'm watching him move now, it's just like, okay, he, he can, he can genuinely mm. get better and he will. Yeah, there's definitely, it looks like there's a bit more confidence in the way he does go about it and just that professionalism. And I love that he's leading that, whether it's just he's you know a better runner than those guys or not. I like that he's trying to take charge of that running group and setting a standard for the rest of them. Like to sidetrack a little bit, like or you could see that clearly with the way Cripps went about training as well, particularly in the match sim that he obviously is going to stand out, but you could see he was setting the tone with just his contested work and just the little things around the stoppages. And as far as Charlie, like he's for one season back from so many years out, hasn't played that many games in this, in the grand scheme of things. He can clearly take it to another level, which is just scary and watch out everyone else. Um, and then, you know, the connectivity and chemistry of, of him and Harry as well. And the, the rest of those small forwards, because I thought, you know, Durden, popped up and, and did a few nice things throughout training. Just the the connectivity of that whole forward group, the more time they have together, you don't know how much that's going to impact each individual and in having a better performance come the end of the year. Yeah. I mean, look, it's exciting. The time of filming this, we've got yes. 34 days to go until round one. We've got a couple of practice matches coming up against the Pies mm. and against Sydney. All of a sudden, that Pies matchup becomes a bit interesting <laughs> if, if Markov decides to... To, the Markov um, Cup. <laughs> yeah, so we'll see how that plays out. But um, any other musings from the session? I've pretty much covered everything mm. that I've written down. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much like all, all I wanted to touch on as well. Like probably the only other thing was I was going into it just wondering where Doherty was maybe going to, to line up, particularly when they said match sim, because with the injury to Zach Williams and maybe not, bringing anyone else in. I know a lot of people, particularly those interested in fantasy as well, whether you're a Carlton supporter or not, there might be a few tuning in, wondering where Doherty is going to line up and kind of split a little bit. Like he was down back, I think, at the start of things. But then particularly as we got going, he was moving into that midfield more, part of those stoppage drills. So it almost seems like the plan is Doherty definitely will have a midfield role at times. How much of it, is midfield compared to defense is still the question mark, but it's good to probably see that we're still going to try that. We haven't just completely abandoned the probably strategy that we're aiming to, to look for at the start of this season and into preseason, uh, which is, I guess, the exciting thing for what he can do to unlock another capacity of this list. Yeah, for sure. 
Well, mate, thanks for joining. Uh, for those of you watching along at home, if you're not aware of the Navy Blue Corner, where have you been? They've been around for long enough now. Um, mate, where can we find the Navy Blue Corner? And you can find us on all socials at Navy Blue Corner, you know, Twitter and Instagram, probably the two we're, we're most active on. If you want to listen to the podcast, it's on Spotify, all the Apple podcasts, all the streaming stuff. And on YouTube, we're going to try and do a lot more video content this year as well. And we, uh, Lockie will probably kill me if I don't mention this. We have started a, a TikTok account. It's na- at Navy Blue Corner. There is nothing on there just yet, but we're looking to have plenty on there and a lot of TikTok maybe exclusive content. So you're not going to find that anywhere else. So yeah, the plug again, I've got to do it at Love Navy it, Blue Corner. Love it. Plug away, plug away. Um, thanks again, mate. And we'll, uh, we'll do this again. We'll link up for sure. Definitely, mate. Thanks for having me on. Go Blues. Go Blues.